And the news agency AFP uh, says Russia has carried out airstrikes on a Syrian rebel base in Idlib province. The UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said at least eight fi fighters from the jihadist militant group Hayat Tahrir al-Sham were killed in the attack. The group controls swathes of Idlib province, one of the last areas still holding out against President Bashar al-Assad. Well, the strikes are Russia's latest intervention. Moscow has spent nearly a decade helping the Assad regime fight a civil war that has killed more than 350,000 people. In July, the Kremlin blocked humanitarian aid to rebel-held Idlib province in, the, in Syria's northwest. It's home to hundreds of thousands of internally displaced Syrians. Anger at Russia in Idlib, Syria's last rebel-held enclave. Aid used to get here across the border from Turkey, but Moscow recently used its UN veto to block the route. Moscow's ally, the Assad regime, has long considered the route a violation of its sovereignty. It wants any aid going to rebel-held territories to go through the regime in Damascus. For people living in Idlib, the aid had been a lifeline, one they don't want under the control of their enemy. We've been displaced to the camps because of Russia's injustice and exile imposed by it and the Assad regime. We fled arrest and came here. Moscow's military support for Assad is still clear. It carried out airstrikes in Idlib just a few days before this protest. Damascus and Moscow have claimed that their strikes only target insurgent groups, but locals say three civilians died here. We're working very hard and calling for an end to these attacks to prevent the loss of lives, injury and the spread of terror and panic among civilians in the northwestern region of Syria. Russia began airstrikes like this in 2015 to support Assad when he was losing control of large areas of Syria to rebels. Since then, Putin's air power has been credited for Assad's survival. Russia has also boosted the Syrian armed forces by sending Wagner mercenaries to fight alongside them. Analysts have also observed parallels between military tactics used in Syria and Ukraine. For example, the brutal bombing and siege of Aleppo, a scenario that then later played out in Mariupol. In return, Russia has gained a strong strategic foothold in the Middle East and a vocal supporter of its narrative about Ukraine. Al-Assad has called Putin's invasion a correction of history. The situation for civilians in rebel-controlled Idlib is similar to that for people in Ukraine. And yet the Western response is significantly different. Ukrainian forces resisting Russia continue to receive support. In Idlib, many feel forgotten, abandoned. If aid isn't allowed in, four million displaced people are threatened by a new war of hunger and danger. For now, they feel they have no recourse but to continue protesting, in hope that one day their voices will be heard. We can pick this up with uh, Omar al Shogri, who is a Syrian public speaker and human rights activist. He's currently director for detainee affairs at the Syrian Emergency Task Force. That's a US-based organization supporting the Syrian opposition. Welcome to DW. Has the world forgotten about the conflict in your country? The world has been ignoring it for a while, but we will never let the world forget about it. We speak about it, we tell the stories as much as we can, and we are present on your channel right now. Right. You say ignoring it rather than forgetting about it, which sounds conscious. Why would, we, why would the rest of the world ignore what's going on in Syria? Firstly, it seems that the world likes to um, blame Russia for a lot of things, which Russia is guilty of, such as, you know, uh, opposing legislation or, or resolutions in the Security Council. And we always say we can't do anything to help Syria. It's too complicated. And that's not the case. You know, we can help Syria in many, many ways. We saw that through um, when, when we had the earthquake. Uh, we actively see that the United States has the power to change things on the ground. Did they do something um, enough to help the Syrian people? They didn't. But also other countries have the possibilities of doing that. So there has been active ignorance of the situation on the ground. The delivery of aid 
should have not been limited to to the UN. It could have been uh, aid could be brought to Syria in multiple ways. We as small organization, the smaller the the, the emergency task force. We are managing of smuggling, getting aid into Syria, and the international community is failing in doing that. When Russia blocks an access to something, we should be able to find another mechanism. It's, we talk about an international community. It's a collection of a, a big number of countries that are not taking their responsibilities. But also, um, when, when I th when I think about it, like I, I talk to you as 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 a human who suffered in Syria. I'm not not talking to you. From in any political terms or any legal terms, I'm talking to you, to someone um, who is the son um, of a father who being killed by the Syrian regime and the Russian air forces, and the, the brother of two brothers who were killed by the Syrian regime and the Russian forces in Syria. When the world wants to react, it can react. Look in Ukraine; you can see that the international community get together to help Ukraine. And what is different? There is small differences, but when there is will, we can always intervene in a way where we can help people protect people on the ground. And you see, Russia has committed the same crimes in Syria. They killed people, they bombed people. You see Maribol and, and Aleppo, the similarities are uncanny. And yet the international community refused to engage in Syria the way they engaged in Ukraine. And why do you think that is? Well, I think that is, well, f the first thing is Syria, the Syrian opposition lacked the leadership that Ukraine has because Ukraine is an is a independent country. Well, in Syria, you have a conf it's we have your own president killing you. That gives, that, ma that makes the process easier. But I think uh, whether whether it's, uh, it's the complete reason or not, I think there is, uh, there is the European people feeling more, uh, the Ukrainian people are more like them, but also the war is closer to them. So they are afraid themselves of uh, of having uh, a, a difficult circumstances on themselves, on their own ground. Uh, and th the most important point is that regardless if the Ukrainians are like us or not, if the Ukrainians uh, are near us or not, when we talk about the story from a, the perspective of a human rights, we should not be discriminating be between whether you are from the Middle East or from Europe, whether you are white or not, whether you uh, you pose you know a threat on our um, neighboring countries or not. Human rights should be um, independent. When you care, you have to care about ab about it without any consideration to political economy or to uh, to danger on your own ground. And that's what is disappointing for us. You know, uh, we support Ukraine because we in Syria we believe that defeating Russia helps us with win in Syria. So for us, it's a common it's a common cause, and that's how we want the world to understand. We want the international community, mm. including you know the countries that are supporting Ukraine, fight against Russia, which we which which we love to see. We want them to also understand that hurting Russia in Syria is important for Ukraine to win in Ukraine, right? And we okay. want to make that understanding. Go ahead. We'll leave it there. Uh, good talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Omar al shogri from the Syrian Emergency Task Force. Thank you. And for more, I'm joined now in the studio by Kristen Helberg, a journalist who's written extensively on Syria. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, let's fill out the geopolitics of this first. Can you help us understand a little bit more why Syria is so important to Russia? Well, Syria is geostrategically a very important place in the Middle East because it lies between Turkey and the Arab world. It lies between Iran and Israel and the Mediterranean. So Bashar al-Assad, 12 years ago, he was the last ally of Russia inside the Middle East. And Russia has used the 12 years of war to build two military bases within Syria. And so Syria makes, marks the, the only access of Russia to the Middle East, uh, to the Mediterranean, sorry, to the Eastern Mediterranean, which means he can control the southern flank of the NATO from the, its naval base in Tartus yeah. at the coast of Syria. So this is strategically uh, the big picture here. Yeah, absolutely. You see the geographic importance of it in that sense. Um, what about this humanitarian situation that we've just seen a little bit about in that report. Do you have a sense of who this is going to benefit? Is there a political winner, as bad as it sounds to say that, from seeing this? There, there definitely is. Bashar al-Assad is the winner of this game over the summer that we've just seen, because Putin, what he did is he saved Assad militarily to help him regain control of the, the big areas within Syria that had fallen under opposition control. Afterwards, now he's interested in working on his rehabilitation internationally. So what we saw over the summer falls exactly 
exactly into this strategy. Putin himself blocking the humanitarian cross-border aid in the Security Council, while afterwards giving Bashar al-Assad the momentum to say, OK, guys, you cannot do this for yeah. the UN Security Council. I will allow cross-border aid now from my side, making him look like somebody who cares for his people, although we have a long track record on how he's using the humanitarian aid for his own grip on power. Yeah, do you, I mean, do you think that's been effective? Is he being rehabilitated? Is he successful with this kind of messaging in any quarters? It already is working out regionally. He has been readmitted to the Arab League in spring, so it is working out. We have seen uh, Turkey Turkish President Erdogan saying that he wants to meet with Bashar al-Assad. Assad feels very reinsured. He uh, asks the Turkish president to withdraw all its troops from Syria, which is something that Turkey at the moment cannot accept because he wants to resettle Syrian refugees in the Turkish-controlled territories in northern Syria. So it's complicated, but Assad definitely feels reassured and is, um, on a, is on a good path from his point of view. Yeah, now one of the reasons I'm so glad you could join us to speak with us today is obviously the war in Ukraine has largely pushed Syria out of global news headlines. Um, has it also affected the resources that Russia is able to devote uh, to its interests in Syria? Right at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, Russia had to withdraw some uh, attack aircrafts from Syria, very practically, because this was the main support for the Assad regime, was the area support from the Russian uh, Air Force. But, uh, and what we see now is obviously that neither Russia nor Iran, who are the, bo the two big supporters of Bashar al-Assad, are able to stabilize the country, because what Bashar al-Assad needs most is money. Mm -hmm. He needs financial aid, he needs economic support for his ruined country, and both of them are embattled themselves. They fall under Western sanctions, so they cannot help in this. So uh, in the end, everybody's waiting for money from the Gulf countries, from Saudi Arabia, from the United Arab Emirates, which is not materializing so far. Mm -hmm. Now, I also want to ask you about a report that's just come out this month from the uh, Institute for the Study of War. They're saying that Russia is coordinating with both the Assad regime and also with Iran to expel U.S. forces from Syria. Uh, do you agree with these uh, with this report's findings. There are some interesting signs here, and we need to understand why the US is in Syria in the first place. They are having 900 troops in northeast Syria to help the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, to fight ISIS. This is cementing one of the very few foreign policy successes of the US during the last few years, which was the defeat of ISIS. So they are there not to fight Assad, not to fight Iran in the first place, but to fight ISIS. Now, this line of contact between the US and the SDF on one side and the Iranians, Russians, and the Syrian regime on the other side was never like a hot line of conflict. Both sides always tried to not uh, attack or to not be driven into some direct confrontation. Now, what we are seeing now is that the Iranians and the Russians and the Syrian regime are trying to create an atmosphere, an a hostile atmosphere to the US troops in their resort in the eastern part of the countries. So you might see attacks by local uh, communities against US troops because they are spreading rumors that the US are trying to invade regime territories. They are spreading rumors that there might be a camel attack mm -hmm. by US forces. So these are all rumors to try to create this hostile environment against US troops and to make them withdraw in the end from Syria. Why? Because this would be the end of Kurdish autonomy mm -hmm. in Northeast Syria. Northeast Syria is very important. It has the few, uh, uh, the few natural resources, the, the gas, the oil there. So the Assad regime needs to control this area. He wants to take back this area gradually, and the U.S. forces are the only life-saving um, uh, people there Standing for the Kurdish, in the way of it. yes, of this uh, self-administration. So this would be the final aim to uh, end Kurdish autonomy and to regain control over the whole of northeast Syria. Well, thank you so much for joining us in the studio to share your expertise. That is Kristen Helberg. We really appreciate your time. Thanks to you. And for more on this, I'm joined by Simon Mabin, Professor of International Politics, who studies sectarian conflict at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. It's good to have you on the program, Simon. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has largely pushed its activities in Syria out of the headlines. Have Western countries also diverted their attention from the Syria conflict? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for covering the story. I think it's incredibly important. And over the past 13 years or so, since we saw the initial outbreak of protests across the Arab world, people have been struggling. People have been struggling to assert 
their their needs, their demands to have their voices heard, none more so than in Syria, where there's been a bloody conflict that's cost hundreds of thousands of lives, millions of people have been displaced. And of course, it's difficult to keep covering that on a daily basis, especially with all the other dynamics, all the other currents going on in the world. And we saw, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine kind of takes prominence over that because it's more more urgent, it's it's more prescient, it's more now, it's it's more current. But that doesn't mean to say that what Russia has been doing in Syria, what the Syrian people have been struggling against, fighting against a really tyrannical, authoritarian, repressive ruler in Bashar al-Assad, none of that has gone away. So I think it's really important that we keep covering this, we keep talking about it, mm. keep remembering that although there is an incredibly incredibly vitriolic struggle going on in Ukraine, there is an intractable conflict continuing in Syria. Right. And Simon, just how has the war in Ukraine affected the, the resources that Russia has been able to commit to aiding the Assad regime? Has it? Well, it's, put, it's put a strain on everything. It's put a strain on everyone. All states that have got a vested interest in the Ukraine conflict have sought to divert what they can to Ukraine, either in support of the Ukrainian troops or in support of Russia. And Russia is no different. It has a finite military capacity. It has a finite economic resources. And it was stretched relatively thin because of the, the engagement in Syria. So what it's had to do is shift its focus, not shift its strategic priorities necessarily, because Syria remains of paramount importance for the Kremlin. But it's shifted a lot of its resources out of Syria back to uh, to fighting in Ukraine. And it started to get involved in Syria in a different way, through the provision of intelligence and continuing to back Assad internationally, cultivate diplomatic relations, provide support on the world stage for Assad and for um, and for its relationships with, with Iran and, and others. We're talking about that Moscow's backing. Um, the Assad regime has still not regained full control of the country. Um, is the Idlib region likely to remain in, in rebel hands? Well, we've heard over the past few years that Bashar al-Assad, the president who's been fighting this brutal campaign, has said repeatedly he will not stop until he has every inch of Syria back under his control. And it is, it is a devastating thing to hear because it means that there is no diplomatic resolution that would be palatable for him if he continues with that rhetoric. And we've seen him take town by town, city by city, province by province, from rebel groups, crushing them on the way. And I fear that this is just the next in line. And the use of aid, as you were talking about in your package, controlling aid, controlling what goes in, mm. will be a key part of that. Simon, just take a moment to, to remind us about what Russia's strategic aims are in Syria and, and in the wider region. So Russia has had a, a, a long engagement with the region, but in, in different ways. It's tried to counter U.S. interests. We've seen that dating back to the Soviet Union and a, a broader struggle between the U.S. and the USSR. That played out in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. But more recently, it's cultivated relations with Syria. It's got uh, a military base in Syria, which is a really important strategic base for the Kremlin. And when uh, when Bashar al-Assad's regime seemed to be um, seemed to be crumbling, and there were a couple of points in the conflict where it looked possible that he might fall, Russia doubled down on Assad because it wanted to retain its military base. It wanted to retain its naval base in Syria because it views it so strategically important to keep that base. And more recently, it's been about countering the U.S., about offsetting U.S. gains and possible uh, U.S. dominance in the region. And, and perhaps quickly before, before I let you go, what other allies does Russia have in its efforts to increase its influence in the region? It's got a complex set of relationships with a whole host of actors. Perhaps the most obvious, aside from Assad, is Iran. But Iran has a complex relationship with, with Russia. It doesn't always appreciate Russian meddling in Iranian history. And it doesn't always appreciate being told uh, or being dictated to by the Kremlin. So Iran is an ally, but a complex ally. 
Russia has also been reaching out to Saudi Arabia through its its relations within OPEC and OPEC Plus. Um, there have been moments where it looked like Russia and Saudi Arabia might be cozying up and developing a more more a cordial relationship. Mm. But the exclusion of Russia from Saudi-led peace talks over Ukraine suggests that that's perhaps not really happening. So Russia is kind of reliant on Assad, on Iran, and by extension on Hezbollah, the Lebanese party of God that is working in Lebanon, but also in Syria in support of Bashar mm. al-Assad. All right, Professor Simon Mabin, it's good talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.